Karen, are Rosie's here yet? Yeah. No? Yeah. Oh, Ken, there they are. Okay. Hank Rosen is one of the old gang, and I forgot to help this now, but he, he saw it all the way through with his machine gun. Him? Yep. So, okay, good afternoon. We're going to start again here. I bought Purple A346. And this is a form on basic training. And it's intended to give the non veterans an idea of what it was, and the veterans an idea to participate with us, or to disagree with us, or to add anything they want. So let, let's have a, a community affair here and keep it informal. And if you have any jokes or like the jokes, and if they're dirty, you got to have them cleaned up first. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the next gentleman. I'm uh, Bob Finley, also um, Company A346. I'm the only infantryman here. The other guy, your weapons. But I, uh, but I uh, allowed. Uh, I was allowed to come in and uh, enjoy your great day. Okay, Lawson, heavy weapons, and we're going to tell you a lot of funny stories. We're going to start with Bob here. And uh, yesterday, when Todd D. Mestino was here, he asked some questions about how you got in the service. So we'll try not to uh, duplicate it too much. Uh, Bob is going to, to tell you about him, which is very similar to me. And then George is going to tell you what brought him to the service at the first part. And it's, uh, I'm going to say, different than anything we heard yesterday. So. When George gets all of it, listen carefully. Okay. Okay, well, I um, is it, is it uh, too close or uh, about right? Okay. Um, I was 17 when I uh, graduated from high school, and uh, at that time, uh, this is with Pearl Harbor time, and at that. Pearl Harbor, I've heard of it, but what are, I'm more interested in girls, and the girls are more interested in boys. Hey, you know. Anyway, um, uh, we're 17, and we were, went into ASD, Army Specialized Training Program, and uh, I went to the University of Maine, and when the rule was that when you uh, turned 18, and you would go take your basic training, and then go back to school. So I was up at the University of Maine, and it was cold up there. We used to get up every morning and just freeze to death uh, out there in front of the dorms and so on. And uh, so I found out that I was going to Fort Benning, and that was warmer weather, and I looked forward to that. And that uh, was uh, exciting anyway, because the average guy at 17 years old uh, really doesn't know what he wants to do with his life. I mean, uh, and, and in this case, the Army made up that decision. And um, you're going to be in the, if you don't join, uh, we will draft you. So anyway, that's what happened. And um, uh, anyway, why, um, one of the, and I liked the training. I really did. I think it did uh, the young folks a lot of good. And uh, instead of sitting around and uh, playing cards or something like that, we were out there um, doing exercises and learning about weapons and learning about uh, combat uh, procedures and nine mile hikes and uh, force marches, we call them. And I remember one of them. We'll get into that later. We want to know how you got into the Army. Yeah, here I am. <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, that's how I got to basic training. And um, I, was, I can't even tell that little anecdote. Not now. Uh, I'll save, save it for later. Give it to George. We want to know what you got just to Hey, George, why don't you try this one? I think you have a big enough interference. All right. Uh, I like how you threw it on this one, all right? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. All right, I'm George Watson, and uh, I was a sophomore in college, and uh, I was coming to class. Every time I went to class, 
there was 19 women and 25 men. And in no time at all, there was 19 women and five men. And three and two, and so finally was two of us. So I went down, I knew somebody in the draft board. And I went down and said, you better take me because I'm going to join if you ever take me. So I volunteered in, and two days later I got my notice. So I would hit both squares. So I uh, came in, and uh, we went through basic training, and I picked up an unusual job. And I stayed with that job as a survey and instrument man with a heavy weapons company. But that's how I was drafted, and I volunteered at the same time. What so, year was that? A double discharge. That's right. <laughs> what year was that? What year was that, George? Uh, 1942. 1942. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, we have a, a list here of the things we'd like to talk about. And uh, I'm listed here for living facilities because, of course, we spent 24 hours a day there at camp. And uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our barracks. George's would have been different. He was in a different camp. But many of us went to both Fort Benning and Fort Jackson with the 87. And in both cases, there were two-story wooden buildings. They housed maybe 40 guys. How many guys in a barracks? Yeah. Yeah. Around 40, 40 guys in a barracks. Had a community restroom, which is no surprise. And uh, it, uh, well, who, who remembers it? How many, how many jobs were there in there? Just All right. Five? Six. Yeah? Who counted the number of guys in the restroom? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, how about urinals? How many urinals? Children? One? Who said one? Yeah. One urinal was a rain trough. But that worked. Okay? Uh, sometimes there were upper and lower bunks. But I don't know, but what, most of the time I was fortunate enough to be where you didn't have to use the upper bunk. Um, I don't know whether the barracks were heated. Um, I don't know why they would be needing heating in Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, but uh, maybe there were cold nights they should have been, but I don't remember that. Of course, they were not air conditioned, no question about that. Um, on our bed, we had, of course, a blanket, a sheet, and a pillow. And um, sometimes the, uh, the sheet and the pillow case would be laundered. Uh, the blanket, the blanket, of course, uh, you just kept using. Saturdays, I'm going to say, were always, always a bad word, always were inspection. And um, the sergeant would gather you together, the corporal and uh, try to get you to make your bed up well and have your clothes in good shape and your rifle in the rack where it belonged. And, and uh, the last thing you did was mop. And you, so you got a pail of water and a mop, and you got to put water on the floor and spread it around, and uh, that was mopping. At least it looked like you worked on it. And then maybe an officer would come in and uh, check some of the guys and check some of the beds and say, uh, Okay, you can have a pass tonight if you want. Be home by 12 or whatever. And uh, so many, many guys on Saturday night would head to town. Uh, if the barracks did... Came uh, huh? back by 11. By 11? Yeah. You didn't know how to beat that, huh? No. Yeah, all right. <laughs> you back by 11. Whether, whether you had to walk or get the bus, huh? Uh, yeah. uh, the mess hall... Uh, and it wasn't really a mess. It was, it was where we ate, of course. Uh, it was a building at the end of the street. I think each company had their own building. And it was a whole company of uh, 200 or whatever it might be at one time. And you formed up as a, as a company to, to march up to it and went in and sat wherever you wanted. And one person at each table, I think they were eight to the table maybe, uh, somehow was designated as waiter. Uh, so he'd go to the, the kitchen area and come back with a, a big tray with food for eight. And uh, then you, you just uh, got more if you wanted it. Food was not bad, not bad really, a little re repetitive. But we did have some things that you didn't have on the home front. 
We had quite a bit of meat. We had milk. We had butter. Um, maybe chocolate. Things that were tough at home. Spam. Spam. Yeah, oh yeah. Spam and, and uh, cream beef on a on a cream beef on something. All right. Uh, you needed a good mess sergeant. And um, how were they? I don't know. I, I, I never found any real problem. The, the quality and the variety were varied. And I guess uh, I don't I don't that. that's what I You got a comment? One comment about food. That's where you learn to eat fast. And if you didn't eat, you, were, you got shorter. I remember that. And it probably, my wife uh, still talks to me about you're eating too fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Anybody want to comment or question before we switch over? I don't think I can emerge, so now a very strange custom I have stayed with me. I was at the uh, phone call <coughs> before I joined uh, the ASTP, and um, the temperature used to rise to very close to 90 degrees every day in the summer of 1943 in Alabama. So they gave us salt pills three times a day, and the way that we took them was that uh, there was a uh, lieutenant at every breakfast table, and uh, there was a, a captain or an officer, and he'd say, one, and they would raise it up, two, and three, you swallowed it, and you drank the water. Well, then they said that there is not enough salt, so when we walked, we went on the hikes, we had to put salt in the canteen. Now, in, in uh, 88 degree temperature in Alabama, with a canteen uh, on your hip, and you're walking for 20 miles, and there's salt in the canteen, you can imagine having to drink saline water Hot water, hot water, food out of the canteen. That's something that I thought the Army, they must have gone crazy with this idea, but it happened. And I guess I said, I did. What happened? What I remember is the guy in front of you always had a white uh, bag because the salt would come out and be absorbed on his uniform. Thank you, Matt. We're going to uh, switch now to the general topic of our training. I mean, I can talk a little bit about we can talk a little bit about how we live, but let, let's let's talk about training. I mean, why we were really there. I think George. Yeah, George is going to start us out on that. Well, as you remember, basic training consisted of of learning uh, to take orders. I had my basic training in Camp McCain, Mississippi, and uh, it was uh, freezing cold at night and boiling during the daytime. Got so hot that we would stop training, uh, start training at four o'clock in the afternoon, and we train into the evening. And we do some cleanup in the early part of the day. We'd open up the barracks uh, doors, one each end, and open all the windows, and uh, stay as cool as we could through the major heat. And it was very intriguing to train at night, especially if they gave you something like infiltrating a course, or, uh, barbed wire, and you'd be crawling up through the night, and suddenly something would go under your nose, and you look down, and there was a snake. <laughs> and you want to back up pretty quick. Uh -huh. <laughs> and they uh, would fill the cans, uh, soup cans, and tie them to the barbed wire 
So if you make too much noise, it would play a little tune for you, you know? And everybody would open fire on you from the defensive positions. And uh, uh, that was kind of scary, even though it was, you knew it was blanks. Oh, you had all these flashes coming. Bang, 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 and somebody opened up the machine gun, bang, same thing. And that was part of the training. And uh, the first training we had in marching, we went out to a field because the year before uh, in Camp McCain, it had been sharecropper country. So they lined us up and they said, we're going to march in that field and train and so forth. And we got there, we couldn't march. The furrows were still in the fields. So they had to bring in the contract as a level of field before we can learn to march, period. And there's a unique, a unique uh, method to train and learning to march, you can be really surprised at how many people can stay out of step. Get out of step and stay out of step. First thing you know, you're walking along and somebody's stuck him on your heel, and you thought, you know, then you're getting step rocks. And did they what about you? What about you? Did they scold you, did they? What? Did they scold you for being out of step? Oh, oh <laughs> Uh-huh. Anyway, I remember a young lieutenant pulling me aside, must have been straight out of uh, OCS, and he said, Watson, your left foot, your left foot, let's put something in your shoe. And then we said, okay, 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 you know, we see that. Anyway, it worked. That was part of the basic training there. And, and one of the other things that happened, they wanted to prepare you to fall into the water with your full gear. So they marched us out to a big lake and they had a, uh, a stand there and they had two fellas in, in bathing suits. And you walked up, you had your rifle on your shoulder, you had a full field pack and you had a helmet on your head and you'd walk up there and somebody would push you off. And you go right to the bottom, bang, and then you hit the sand and kick up and kick your way in. Well, they wanted to make sure that everybody could swim. And so that, that's happened. So I remember when going into France, uh, going down a ladder, a rope ladder, and looking down and seeing the landing craft infantry. And as the boat was there, the landing craft step away. And it was two miles between, I knew it, between the boat and that. You had to go down, and then the boat would come back in and you could into the boat, and so forth. With your pack, all your gear. And it was good training, you know, when you kicked us off the dock, it was nice and cool. It was beautiful down there in the lake. And it wasn't freezing cold, it was in Mississippi. And what could be better? George, uh, I didn't do that. Did you no, no, I didn't. No? How many guys here did that jumping in thing? One, two, three, four. All right, an accident. <laughs> we, we jumped about 30, 40 feet <coughs> just to get into what you might have to jump off the top. All right. I, I, got a, I have a comment. I have a comment about this Our training. How many times have we got to do that? Oh, uh, twice. Maybe four times. Four times. Four times, yeah. I have a comment about the training. One of the things that we did was a nine-mile force march, which I think uh, was pretty good training for all of us. And what, where you jog a while and you walk, or you jog a while for nine miles. And there would be a, a point where you'd stop and catch your breath a little bit. Well, we stopped in this field, and along came a uh, farmer, horse-drawn cart, with a whole bunch of watermelons in the back. We descended on that. <laughs> and, I mean, we didn't steal them, but we bought them. And he, would, he had the best financial day he ever had in his whole life. <laughs> and we ate them, and they, they were the best watermelons we've ever had in our life. George, you got more on training? Yes. Uh, I'm going to pass to England now. <laughs> so I'm supposed to be doing anything. We're in England. And we're set, situated in an old mill and uh, three stories high. And one bathroom. One bathroom. So they uh, some one of the houses across the way was leveled and they put in outdoor plumbing for us. That was a coal scuffle 
under a hole. <laughs> so we would basic train, we would march in the street. And uh, after the first time out, uh, we were marching, and an old gentleman, you posted somebody at the corner. And if a vehicle was coming through, they'd holler and you'd disperse somebody, which wasn't very often. But anyway, uh, this old gentleman came around, and we were basic marching. He came by. Oh, it was the worst smell in the world as he came by, a um, big mustache and a slouch hat, and he had a cart, and you could look either side of the cart. And when he came down the line, everybody said, my God, what is he doing, what is he doing, and why is he here, and so forth and so on. His job was to empty the coal cycles. <laughs> and, but it never happened again because we posted a guard at the corner, and he had... <laughs> He'd say, escort, and everybody just run. <laughs> and he said, we fall back in here in 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And when he just saw this old gentleman, that was a call. And he pick out somebody out a very loud voice. And then, that was it. You did, you're going to tell us about maneuvers. Well, yes, we did go on maneuvers. Actually, in the, uh, from camp to camp, we went on maneuvers and do Kentucky and so forth, yep. And uh, it was very interesting because uh, it rained, we were there 90 days, and it rained 87 days. 87, pretty 87. That's right, 87 <laughs> days. And uh, there's a bit of poem written about this whole thing. And it was posted in the GAM, in the old GAM. You remember that, Mitch? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Did Mac write it? Uh, no, Mac wasn't there at the time. time. No, no, he wasn't. And uh, very interesting because if you, if they taught you how to exist in the rain with your tent, and you, you pitched a tent, and then you uh, <coughs> dug a little trench all the way around it, and uh, and the flow of water would go around the tent if you pitched it right, and you always looked at the proper ground for the natural thing. You know, a lot of these guys would say, ah, you know, I don't know, I don't roll up in a blanket. And uh, roll up in a blanket, the next morning we would be crawling out of the tent, and it would be a huge bonfire lined up with all these blankets. And the fellas standing up there, uh, 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 and we were nice and dry. And he said, that's soldiering for you. I just wondered if there was any, uh, you were talking about marching in step. I understand there used to be some colorful cadence songs. Do you remember any of the marching songs? <coughs> <coughs> the cadence, does he hear me? I didn't hear all that. The, the cadence, when you were marching, the cadence. Keep the rhythm. I well, understand was there were some colorful was songs. There was cadence calls. You know, the, the, the songs, did you have right. songs? Oh, yes, you can't say up here. <laughs> they were known songs with different words. <laughs> they were very stimulating words. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most of us that are under 30 will cover their cover ears. Right here. ears. Yeah, yeah. You know, the basic training, they taught you how to clean a bathroom, and they taught you how to peel potatoes, and to wash duck boards, and to make a bed. You know, it was a lot to make a bed. But you always wash your hands in between, right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> George, what's a dump board? We don't know what that is. Uh, that's a board, just a wooden board, uh, where the uh, uh, the boards are separated, <coughs> and they stood on that so have a natural drainage way, and their feet would stay dry. You know, wherever they were. So if you were not yeah, you were behind in the counter, shower, and you were serving shower. coffee, there's going to be a drip or anything of that sort, extra vegetables that are going to fall on you, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> That's the idea. The lady asked about songs, and Jory said, yeah, there's some, some words that we're not going to repeat. There were more cadence words, but there's one song, and I don't know if we sang it, but uh, it was uh, Turn of Bogey March, you know that? And it was from one of the movies, uh, what movie? Uh, they were anyway. from the bridge on the river. Why? Bridge on that the river. was long Why? after World Thank War II. Anyway, the song went to the do make the grass grow free. Do make the grass grow free. All right. 
there, there was one song that you can repeat here that we sang to, and it was shooting on the rifle range, a bullseye every time. But when I quit, I saw I'd hit the target next to mine. <laughs> We're going to have a story about the rifle range, too. Uh, I, I got a little bit to add to, uh, to this uh, training pit. We were taken at night several miles out into the country on a dark night. And out there they had a set of bleachers set up big enough for a company, I guess. And we we're on a sort of a hillside, and I'm going to say a mile, because I think that's what the intent was, a mile away across the valley for some people. And those people over there were instructed to do certain things. And we were instructed to be quiet and watch and listen. So what did we watch and what did we listen? We watched a person puff on his cigarette and see the red glow. We watched a person go to his mess kit to get out his fork and we heard the noise from that. We listened to a couple guys whispering to each other we can hear that. I don't know what else we watch or listen to, but it's something that I kept with me all my life as to one of the trainings I had as to how sound and light travel when there's nothing to divert your attention from that. It was very interesting to me. Um, gas mass. Of course, we had gas mass, but uh, they didn't last very long. Uh, here again, I'm going overseas like I should. Our, our Lieutenant Joe Boyle, uh, the first night we went into France, he says, dig a hole. Okay, we dug a hole. He says, throw your silverware in it, except for your spoon. So we threw our silverware in. He says, now throw your gas mask in. He says, they haven't had any gas yet. We're not going to have gas now. So you don't need your gas mask. To keep the little carrier because it's a nice little, little uh, uh, thing to, to carry. The infiltration course, George alluded to it as part of maneuvers, but it's something we had to do uh, to earn our combat infantry badge. Um, there was barbed wire spread about two feet off the ground, I guess, and then there were charges in the sand that they could set off. And then over here, wherever it was, there are machine guns with live ammunition, they told us, and uh, tracer bullets. Yeah? I was at the heavy work and set up the fire. You did the fire. Did you have some live ammunition in there? Okay. Anyway, so your, your goal, of course, was to draw 100 yards or whatever it might be. Uh, under this barbed wire uh, with the fangs going off and going up the sand here and there and these tracer bullets over above you and you knew darn well you shouldn't stand up and take with that barbed wire there so you had a chance either to get out by crawling and creeping or freeze there I don't know that anybody froze there but I'm sure sometimes somebody did okay. yeah, and then, then you know the firing had stopped and they'd bring it on well, we allowed to come three feet off the ground we sandbagged the, micro, the uh, machine guns and sighted them in uh, the day before. And then we had a general inspection, somebody coming out from the regiment and walk out with the machine guns to the police station. Okay, sandbag that again. Take it out and start all over again. And then you have a target three feet off the ground. If you remember, they said, don't stand up. Don't stand up. Stay on your belly. Stay down there. That's it. Anybody out there want to ask or add? Start with Mac, I guess. As we got to uh, gas and train basic training films, they had a demonstration with uh, new draftees getting accommodated to the methane gas. 
and how to put on your gas mask. And they were told that gas smelled something like new mown hay. And in the basic training film, it showed these three farmers from Kansas. They were coming over the hill, and one of them explained, wow, new mown hay. <laughs> <laughs> they all got consumed with the gas. Oh, Somebody else back there. Yeah. Um, I just want to briefly uh, mention uh, from before McClellan, Alabama, in 1943, we used to uh, go into the uh, Talladega National Forest. They have uh, racing there these days, Talladega. Anyway, um, the forest was teeming with chickers and ticks. So uh, there was nobody who was uh, training at that time who was <coughs> having chickers and ticks in the most sensitive parts of their body. And the only way that I know of, and I experienced it, to get rid of the chickers and ticks was to turn a cigarette, light it, towards your body to force them out. So sometimes the guys suffered from burns <laughs> to their bodies trying to get rid of the chip or something. Barney had his hand up. How long was basic training Well, theoretically, I guess it was as still as 13 weeks uh, for infantry. I don't know about artillery or anything else, but 13 weeks. And uh, uh, of course, uh, George was different because he was in McCain first. But Bob and I each had 13 weeks at, at uh, Benning, and many of these gentlemen did too. And then we went to uh, Fort Jackson, and we're at Fort Jackson training on the 87th from uh, probably March through October, wasn't it? Yeah. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. Something like that before we uh, got on the boat. Well, Bob, that was the story about I told you. Uh, you know that issue of the bayonet? Was it a heavy weapons? Heavy machine gun mortars. Heavy machine gun company, heavy mortars. And, um, oh, you would, uh, uh, I'll hold it first. You would, you, would, you would go out. You can't put a bayonet on a heavy machine gun unless you're. Sylvester Stallone or somebody like that. <laughs> Nobody ever did that. I never saw anybody do it. Uh, only the theater of the bus never issued a name that. And uh, uh, there were other things too. In a heavy weapons company, uh, take Mac, he was a waterman. He was issued a carby. You can't carry rounds of ammunition. Explain it back. Explain it back. What you get is an ammunition barrier. Why you were issued a carbine. Well, I don't know why I have to explain it. It's evident. <laughs> Carrying uh, 42 pounds of ammunition, each round weighed about 6.72 pounds, and you had a pouch which is with a front and back compartment. You're supposed to sling it over your head. But you had a pack on your back, so you couldn't do that. So you clenched the handle and just threw it over one shoulder. So you had 42 pounds of ammunition on your shoulder. But the, uh, your squad leader had an M1 rifle, and uh, the, the gunner of the mortar carried a sidearm, a pistol, 45. And the rest of us ammunition bearers or preparers carried M1 carbines. Uh, no point of carrying an M1 rifle. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. I have one more comment about, uh, this was kind of unusual. Um, we had a guy in our company who could not get in a prone position to shoot a rifle. Now, the, the key position is, you can lie on your stomach, and you, your elbow is over like this, on one side, and your rifle goes this way, and it's in your shoulder. He couldn't do it. 
And uh, I don't know whatever happened to him. He couldn't do anything about <laughs> He couldn't, he was just very disoriented, very uh, disconnected in his joints. And I, he finally left their company. I don't know whatever happened to him. But that's what it's crazy. Okay, where are the comments? Yeah. Would you about the pup check? I will. I will. Yeah. Okay. Ernie and then a lady back there. I'm like, uh, this is coming out like, I just like to make some amends to basic training. I went to Fort Benning, arrived there at the beginning of December. We were housed in one story huts. Uh, it maybe had 24 in there, double bunks. And on the front doorway, it says, no, this hut burns in 15 minutes. <laughs> Our heat was a little pot belly stove in the middle of the barracks there. We burned the soft coal that smoked and smelled a little bit. But we couldn't use that at night, even if this was the middle of winter. That had to go out. And, and one way we used to clean that stove, we would take a blank cartridge and throw it in there when the embers were dying. And it cleaned out the stove. <laughs> so, another point, you mentioned something about the food. Uh, I learned how the word chow pound was derived. We had tables of eight people. And as an example, for breakfast, they would put 10 pancakes out there. You took one pancake. The fast eaters got more than one. <laughs> and we didn't have milk. If we wanted milk, we had to buy a half pint of milk. That was, that was Fort Benning to us. Now, another thing that some of the actual basic training some of them talk about night maneuvers. Well, one of our maneuvers at night was that under those woods, you know, it got pretty dark. It said, real dark. We were walking, we didn't know where it was. They said, grab the back, the pack of the man in front of you. Don't let go. If you let go, you didn't know where you were, and no one else would either. And, and, and we would slog through the woods, through the swamps, everything else, because that was basic training. And uh, one part of this thing was, was maneuvers, a couple of days maneuvers, and we were out there, and uh, everybody dug his own foxhole, and uh, somebody says, but the cadre, probably one of the cadre says, but be careful when you watch what these foxholes at night because there are coral snakes in the woods. And they're probably one of the most venomous snakes there are. They're not large, but they've got a good bite. Well, during the, some of these night maneuvers, I don't know how it happened that someone, one of the officers, or one or more had it in for some of the other ones. And all I remember, and knew pretty well that our battalion commander got a group together and slashed all the ropes on the tent of the, probably the regimental commander. Well, this went through the camp, we, you know, our, our, at least our area, and then we're wondering what's going to happen to our major, what's going to happen to our major. Nothing, I think he was promoted in the end. <laughs> uh, one last thing, talk about the temperatures. We went on the rifle range, and this was again, middle of winter. Well, we had one cold spell, and of course we had our barracks bags with us. Well, and sleep, and we were in pyramidal tents, what is it, maybe six or eight in a tent or something, uh, on the cots along the peripheries. It got so cold, <coughs> we actually ended up throwing our barracks bags and everything else on top of us, anything <laughs> to, to stay a little warmer. <laughs> Uh, you know, Fort Jackson was hot, but Fort Benning in, in the winter, through the winter time, was not very warm. Back to carrying uh, every day. Uh, I wasn't saying every day. Every day when you got up, you went to formation before breakfast, roll call. And then they would tell you the orders of the day. 
They would tell you your uniform. They would tell you what your pack would be, whether it's light pack, small pack, full pack, weapons, no weapons, and so forth. But what would a full pack weigh without your weapons and the ammunition? I would say that pack weighs around 12, 15 pounds. Anybody, what do you think? Full fill pack weighs nine pounds. Nine pounds? Ninety. Ninety uh, pounds? A full fill pack weighs ninety pounds. Well, mine didn't. <laughs> 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 I won't made it. I can get it. Yeah, count that pack is lighter. Short pack. Yeah. I have to voice. Back there, Dan. Yeah. All right. Yep. I can't. I can't, Mississippi. Just a sad note, it was not unusual, Camp, I'll preface that, but Camp McCain, Mississippi was a former Negro CCC camp. And we can't tell you how bad it was because you wouldn't believe us if we told you. I can tell you that it was not unusual to break out for Reveille, and we didn't have pavement, we stood in the mud and the dirt, and we'd look in the trees, and we'd see guys who had hung themselves during the night. That was not unusual. Not unusual. Uh, where did this happen? Camp McCain, Mississippi. You were there. Yeah, where, where did that happen? Yeah. Where did that happen? Not your camp. Where in the camp? During, my, during basic training. Yeah, but where in the camp? Where? In the trees. I don't know. <laughs> you know, well, you wherever were there were trees. You were there, you must have seen it. Well, I'm trying to figure out where they, I never heard of that. Where did you have your parade ground? The parade ground was right at the end of the company street. Oh, no, out further than that you had your parade Not ground. because you would yeah. bring in the band with a megaphone and hook it up, and the band would practice while you marched in no. the morning, and it wasn't far from there. What kind of a band did you have? It was a regimental band. Ah. No, not, not my outfit we didn't have a regimental band. Well, we, we had drums, and what's this thing that you hold underneath your arm and put it? Bagpipe. 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 That's what we had. Bagpipe. I was in the 345th, and I went in there. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Way back. Later, man. Yeah. Yeah. Fred Whitaker. Thank you. I had my basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. It was a 13-week basic training, and there were two events that uh, I particularly remember. It would be we had a uh, pegged in the ground, and it would go up to a to a pole, and then it would be pegged on the far side. So he had he had the first man run up and fall face down on the barbed wire, covering his face with his arms. And the next man came up and stepped on his back and leaped over him over the other side of the barbed wire. I thought that was a rather creative way of getting across the barbed wire, and I always hoped I would be the second man. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that um, happened, he, he was trying to uh, illustrate to us how difficult it is to pass a command or a message from one person to another without having the message distorted. So he had ten men lined up and he whispered the message to the first man and the first related to the second and so forth till it got to the other end. And the tenth man repeated the message that he had received. It had no resemblance to the message that he gave the first man. It is very difficult for people to pass on a measure, uh, message without editorializing. <laughs> you mentioned gas masks. One of the less uh, uh, enjoyable experiences I recall from basic training was the training in the use of a gas mask. The gas mask was kept in a, in a thing that was under your left shoulder, under your left arm, and with a full uniform on, including your your helmet, liner, and steel helmet, everyone went into a large tent that was filled with tear gas. And when you went in the tent, after you got in with the tent with all the tear gas, 
you had to take the gas mask out of its container, get your helmet off, put the gas mask on. They told us to blow what air you had had from holding your breath, to blow in the gas mask, to try and blow the tear gas out of your gas mask before it's completely seated around your, your face and then get your helmet back on and only then, after you had then breathed through the gas mask a couple of times, would they let us come out of the tent that had been filled with tear gas. Yeah. Well, yeah. Periodically, we were issued gas masks while in combat but nobody believed we would have gas. So we would take the gas mask out of the container and throw the gas mask away and use the container to carry stuff. Well, one day we're walking along and somebody yelled, gas, gas! And everybody reached in the container. There was no gas mask. Fortunately, it was a, uh, a mistake. But there were those of us who were pretty upset for a few minutes because we thought finally we needed the gas mask and we didn't have one. But there was no gas, fortunately. When you're in the field, uh, you dig a trench, narrow enough for you to straddle. And so that was it. So it was, you, you'd be given a, a job to go out and dig a sweet trench, and you do that. And you know, I've had some of the most marvelous conversations in the moonlight facing somebody who's straddling that trench. And you were given the um, train duty. And you had to keep the train closed. At that time, as a, there was a, still a lot of old army in there. And they had all the trees set up. And in one corner, they had a, a bathroom set, a, a toilet, and over the top it said, venereal disease. That was it. If you had venereal disease, that was your bathroom. <laughs> so when, when the fellows came in and said, okay, you know, to Bob, you're on the train do we Bob would come in like this. <laughs> and they go out the same way. <laughs> so uh, that was the... Uh, the uh, end of that, but they didn't continue that on when the, the rest of the group came in. And when we first formed the 87 uh, down in Camp McCain, it was loaded with Southerners, you know, Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, and so forth and so on. And we had a lot of people come in where they really couldn't read. They made a mark and somebody signed their name for them. And we had situations when they came in and you'd say, uh, somebody came up to me and he'd say, I'm sitting in my bunk on Saturday afternoon, and he said, would you read my mail? I said, no, I'm not going to read it anymore. Why would I read your mail? I'm not interested. And he'd go away and come back a little later, and he said, I can't read. And I'd say, how'd you get in here? I made him a mark. <laughs> now, these are a lot of something. So we trained them up as best we could, but trained with them. And we all went on leave after the uh, basic training. And while they were gone, we had our list come down and say, we need replacements for Africa, and we need replacements for Italy. And we emptied the, uh, the division and sent that overseas. Then they closed up the ASDP, and we got all the college boys. So all the boys from, from the college came down, and. They wound up as jeep drivers and ammunition bearers and blah, 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 and all the jobs that we didn't want. Well, of course, the NCOs never did the job anyway. <laughs> but you always have to get to a rank of some kind, especially you know, a premier rank was corporal, because then you were an NCO. And I remember my promotion to that particular position. I was doing KP. And I went to the orderly room in a break, and I looked down the list. And there I was. I was a corporal. So I didn't report back to the mess hall, and the mess sergeant came looking for me. What the fuck? I'm burning you on blah blah. Come on, and that stuff. I said, Come on with me. As you can see, we got an agenda uh, in front of us.
and this is supposed to be until 3 o'clock, and it's getting close. Now, we can go on, but once it's 3 o'clock, if you want to walk out, go ahead, but we'll, try, we'll probably continue a few minutes after 3. And I, I have to pick up here a story. Barney was talking about the night bivouac and uh, putting your hand on the belt of the guy in front of you to get out of the woods. Well, in our platoon, uh, we were bivouacked at night, and it was a moonless night intentionally, and the, uh, the exercise was to go out, make no noise on your way, go in, picture camp in the dark, and your pump camp, as you may know, was two shelter halves and uh, two ridge poles that folded and six pegs or whatever it might be, and uh, a flap on the front uh, to keep the boogies out. And uh, so you're supposed to do this in the darkness, and then when the corporal came around in the morning and shook your foot, uh, you get up very quietly, and you undo your pump tent, and you put your your pack back together, and your, it was a light pack probably, which rolled into the shelter half, and you put on your pack, and you waited for the corporal to, and you moved out. So we moved out. I don't know whether we were doing it like Barney was, but we did move out. We headed down the road finally, and it was getting daylight. And the corporal says, okay, roll call. So we started roll calling, and there's one guy missing. Who's missing? Willie. Well, who was Willie with? Parker. Parker, what happened to Willie? He said, I don't know. I took down my half the tent. I guess he's still there. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, we have one. Come, let's go to weapons, because that's the next time I live. So. All right. I have uh, very few things that I dislike. I'll eat about anything except caraway seeds. But there was one other one I forgot about, and that's grits that were introduced when we went down to Fort Benning. That was one product that I just couldn't stomach. And uh, uh, to this day, it's my You're going to go on with weapons now? All right, go ahead. Uh, a personal story. Uh, as I said, I was a survey and instrument man. And uh, I was issued a grand rifle. And then after I cleaned it up and everything was set, they called me back down to the orderly room and they said, okay, you get an old one Springfield full of cosmolines. So I had to take that back and clean it up and so forth and so on. And then they called me back and they said, no, with your job, you have to take a 45. So I had a 45 and put back the uh, perfect, beautiful, clean O3. So I wound up with that. And uh, then they called me down in the orderly room and they said, uh, okay, you have to carry this bolo knife. And I had a bolo knife and a scabbard and a 45 on my hip. And I was carrying a 300 radio sometimes. And um, uh, I never knew actually what happened, and they outfitted me with different overcoats. I had first a basic overcoat, then I had a yellow driver's coat, and uh, then when they issued me the bolo knife, and I went back to the company, and they said, oh, we're going to the Pacific. And then they called me back up to the other room again, and they said, take off the bolo knife. I said, okay, so I have 45 then. So uh, when we eventually went into action, I was carrying a grand and I had a 45. So uh, then I had to turn in the 45. So when we were down uh, in uh, Metz, uh, there was a tanker there. And the job was very frequently was by myself. And I wanted something to put out firepower. And they had something called the grease gun. And it cost the government $20 to make that gun. It was made out of sheet metal at a barrel, and you had a clip that you flip in the bottom, and you could shoot 20 rounds. And I wanted that because, you know, if I came around the corner and I bumped into the enemy, I wasn't out to kill him. All I wanted to do was duck down so I could get the hell out of there. <laughs> and uh, so I kept the grease gun for until we uh, went to camp uh, Lucky Strike. 
and then we were allowed to turn our weapons in. But I never knew from time to time. Now, I want to tell you one other funny story. When I was issued the coat, the coat, that was in England. It was driver's coat and had a yellow sheen to it. And it looked pretty snappy. had a nice collar on it. So I had hanging my, my uh, above my foot locker there, and then this fellow came over to me, a buck sergeant, he said, say, sorry, can I borrow your coat? I got a date tonight with an English girl. And I said, uh, nah, nah, nah. all right, go ahead, Mo. Take, take the coat. Be careful, huh? I kept it in good shape. So the next morning when I wakened, my coat was hung up. But I was smoking something terrible, terrible. Didn't figure out what it was. And I looked up and it was my coat. And uh, the coat obviously was uh, put down in some kind of animals. Uh, here. So I said to, I said to uh, Mo, I said, hey Mo, you better get my coat cleaned up. I said, how'd that happen? He said, well, I was with this girl and we came down to the wall and I threw the coat over the wall and I lifted her over the wall and we sat on your coat. <laughs> and there I was. <laughs> so that's just one of the funny things that do happen to you. You know, you rolling stuff out, but we're very careful about it after that. And uh, as far as uh, yeah, additional weapons are concerned, uh, we had uh, uh, the machine guns and we had heavy mortars and we would go uh, for instance, if Bob's company was a rival company and they were going to attack, they felt that maybe they needed greater support. I'd have to go over and look at the situation and ask Bob about it. And he'd tell me, and I'd say, okay, call by. Send two heavy machine guns in the morning up. And I ran into a situation like that. I was called up. I spoke to the sergeant of that particular platoon. And they were setting up. They were going to big white a tank and maybe 30 or 50 Germans. And we sent out a patrol to corroborate this, and they said, yes, probably 25, 35 Germans with a tank was coming up the road. I called back, I think, with machine guns. I waited for them there. They came up, we positioned them, and so forth. And meanwhile, and I had to stay overnight to make sure these guns came up in the morning. And uh, so I stayed over there, and the sergeant dug in uh, by that wall, and I dug in some bushes here. And I was going down, I was digging a foxhole, I was down to my knees. And I had a very eerie feeling. You remember after walking into a room or a situation, and you just felt everything wasn't right. Just to, and I looked up, and here was a German soldier holding his Mauser rifle, which was bolt action. And I looked up, and he startled. He was staring at me as I worked. I guess he was supposed to look up to the enemy. So when I saw that, and my rifle was in back of me, and but I had a 45, a thousand thirty-eight, I'm sorry, in a whole set. And when he saw me, he came too, and I came too. And I pulled a, pulled a pistol out, and I was oh, maybe a foot from his head. And instinctively, you took things, so I squeezed off, I think, two shots by my and I remember, forget that. His nose went one way and the helmet jumped up in the air. And, and I thought he was going to fall back, but he fell towards me and I bent down. And he fell on top of me. And he, as he came down, the rifle butt struck me in the hip. And I thought he had broken my hip. And uh, so I straightened up, I'm starting to straighten up. Meanwhile, the sergeant heard the shots, and he came over with his M1 in a crouched position, firing bang, 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 bang. And I could feel the, imp the impact in the German. He was hitting the German. And I said, stop, stop, it's me, it's me. I didn't want to be killed by him. <laughs> so I came up, and uh, he came up to me, and we threw the German off, and put him in front of us, and we threw some snow on him, and we used him as a buffer. Sounds crude, doesn't it? But you know, self-preservation. You do things that you were not trained to do as a child. We spent a lot of time on the rifle range. And it was mainly with your M1 Grand Rifle. Uh, but you also use your carbine there and so forth. But Bob's going to tell us about the rifle. We did. <laughs> we, we did spend a lot of time. and. Um, expression called Maggie's Draws. If you uh, you're, you're shooting out there, if you didn't hit the target, 
His flag would come up. It's called Maggie's Draw, the red flag, and you didn't, you didn't do well. Uh, but the objective of, uh, of all of the guys in the infantry was to get the combat infantryman's badge, which means that you had to do a very good job uh, on the rifle range. And so if you didn't if you didn't do well one time, you were that was your number one objective for the next time you went out to the rifle range. And I think most of the guys did get uh, their the combat infantryman badge. It meant a little more money, but uh, in your paycheck and percentage-wise, it was very good. But in spendable dollars, it was not much. <laughs> and uh, uh, at any rate, um, uh, that was something we all wanted to do. And uh, now let's see what it'll take. And uh, small detail: was well, that the expert infantryman? Yes, yeah, expert. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then in combat, then you got. Them. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Bob, well, Bob's checking his notes here. Uh, when we went to the rifle range, uh, you had kind of a big mound of dirt. And then back up here, you had the, where the people are shooting from, whether you're standing, kneeling, or flat down like Bob was illustrating here, and then uh, 100 yards or whatever it is away is this bank of dirt and with all these targets sitting up above it. Well, those targets were on a pulley and a rope. So for each target, there's either one or two guys, it's two guys down in there. And once uh, the guy shoots, you got radio connection. Once the guy shoots, it's five shots or whatever, you pull it down and you look at the holes in the target, and uh, you get so many points, so the other guy records it, then he uses a piece of tape and you pinch the hole, and so forth, and pull it up so somebody else can start. So that's the way you made your points in order to qualify the expert infantry things. Now one day, with this radio communication, somebody up above, uh, where they were shooting from, talk to the guy in the pits that's pulling the targets. He says, we got an officer coming up now. So that officer didn't shoot very damn well that day. I'll tell you. Okay, now that's it. All right. Uh, I've got a little after three. We've got uh, uh, a little more things we can do. Uh, what do you think? Go for it. Keep it up. Keep okay. it going. Okay. All right. Uh, anything more? Anything on weapons training out here? Yes. All right. Just a minute. The mic's coming. Get it over. Before you went on guard duty in the States, you had an inspection. 
to make sure he was appropriate for whatever you're going to guard. And then the corporal of the guard would pick one of you that looked the best and call him a supernumerary. So the other guys had to go out there with their two and four hours or whatever. And, uh, and the supernumerary was just there in case somebody fell dead. Now, your guard duty when you're in combat can be a heck of a lot of difference because I think Bob was just talking about a, a house they were in a fountain of champagne or something and how they posted guards all around the house. Um, so wherever you were, uh, there was guard duty. I remember the first night I was in France. Um, I was on guard duty for an hour or two hours when anybody else was sleeping. And I stood there under a big tree, um, kind of comfort thing to be a tree when it's snowing and cold and so forth. And what was I doing there? I don't know. I was just there to make sure if anything unusual happened, I'd call a, a sergeant or if a German came over, but we're 50 miles away from him, so I didn't expect that. But guard duty and KP <coughs> and uh, latrine duty were, were things that anybody could expect almost any time, and, and of course it's part of your job. Yeah. Uh, does anybody um, does anybody agree or disagree with me when I say that my contention is that American weapons and World War II infantry weapons were generally inferior to German weapons? Amen. Anybody agree or disagree? I, can, I, I have a piece on the 87th Division website an article uh, taking, contending that uh, each weapon, rifle, well, no, our M1 rifle was probably superior to the German rifle, but I thought that, and I had some of these weapons, so I picked up from the dead Germans and I fired them, and my contention is that generally uh, the German weapons uh, their machine guns, their pistols uh, were superior. We had more weapons. If we lost weapons, uh, we could get them replaced. Uh, maybe the Germans couldn't, and they probably suffered uh, from that point of view. However, uh, again, it was my evaluation that German weapons were of uh, a very high order and that they were superior on the whole. According to the sergeant, point blank, and according to the sergeant, he missed the German who turned around and ran. <laughs> All right, yeah, that wasn't 50 yards either. Anybody else have weapons? Right here, have it. I had a Colt 45 for a time, and I would take uh, exception. Uh, it, it was more uh, difficult to hit something with it, but when it did, its slug was bigger oh, yeah. than the others, and the person you hit was on their back. And I think that was a big thing. Well, you're a better shot than I was, I guess, too. You know, 45 got a lot of poop. Yep. Give them a... They made a suit, a duck suit out of that. 
Okay, my, my uh, duffel bag and my pants were gone. Now, I was an enlisted man, and but I had this friend, the officer, a tall guy, and he said, you can't miss the, this opportunity. So he gave me officer pants to wear uh, into town. And that was a, that was wall to wall people in, uh, in, in Paris. And you, we got off the train and you just could not move in that place. It was just, everybody was cheering because that was the end of the total war. And um, so, and the reason I was that way, I was in, I was in air, transferred to Air Force headquarters. And um, uh, I got a, I one other little story I gotta tell you. Because of that, I was able to take a seven-day furlough to Switzerland for a total cost of a dollar and a half. <laughs> I'll tell you how I did it. <laughs> Over there in, in Wiesbaden, Germany, uh, you could buy cigarettes, uh, a carton of cigarettes in the PX for 50 cents. You could sell it in the black market for $50. But you couldn't take the money home. You couldn't send it home. You could only send home whatever your paycheck was, which was very much. So for three, uh, for a dollar and a half, I got three cartons of cigarettes, sold them for 150 bucks. I could spend the money over there, and that's what I did. I'm running out of, running out of and I see you, Mitch, but let, 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 me, let me just do something here first. Um, we had, of course, training film. This is part of what, what we did. And for each weapon, we had a training film on, on the equipment. Uh, we had movies on the home front, almost like movie town kind of rule, uh, movies you got at home, or newsreels you got at home. Uh, they talked about wartime production, the women's work, a uh, portion of it, rationing, selling war bonds. There's a Why We Fight film, which is a uh, morale booster. Wouldn't it be a Frank Camper? Frank Camper did a lot of, of uh, military uh, and combat tactics, personal hygiene, and the guys that saw, I don't know what, I, what, what I'm meaning there, as we mentioned saw, I guess Barney mentioned saw. We also had, I think it was Atrebreen. Atrebreen, I think, went in your um, um, canteen, canteen. Uh, against malaria or something like that. So if you get your your water out of a mud puddle or something, um, you, you put aftergreen in it. Um, I had a list of what we were issued, but I guess we don't need to go that. You know, we had um, weapons and clothing and packs and so forth. Um, oh, mail call. Uh, mail call was held. Well, I won't say how often, whenever, whenever they got mail. Uh, when you had a company or the company formation out on uh, the company street, uh, they would, uh, somebody there, probably the first sergeant, would go through the mail and hold it up, and of course it went to where it belonged to. Some guys got a lot, some guys got very, very little. Now, uh, George wanted to say something more, and I think Mitch wanted to say something. Okay, go ahead. I was in Times I was in Times Square. I was in Times Square on VJ Day. And you know the picture of the nurse and the, uh, the Navy man? Yeah. Uh, I was nearby. I did not see that particular maneuver. But I was trying to kiss young ladies myself. <laughs> and there were other people, other males, trying to kiss females. Uh, out of the, we don't have time to discuss anything else about it, but I thought I would mention it. And Paris, my first assignment after I got out of the hospital was the MPs. I went right to Paris. And uh, I was there on uh, VE Day, and for some reason, uh, I didn't put myself on the duty roster for that night. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to tell us any more about that. <laughs> I can tell you other stories about Paris. I want to tell you a little story about uh, the end of the war in Paris. At the end of the war, Patton was taking 
certain men out of the line and sending Paris for three days. You were dirty, you rode on a big old vehicle, and you went to Paris and got in a very nice hotel. He had taken that over. So uh, you walked in and he signed in and he gave you a room and went up to the room and there was a real bed. Mm -hmm. so the first thing you did, you jumped into the shower for three hours and uh, then you got waiting around, they called you up, they said, we're sending up the tailor, the manager you tailor. You measured for a uniform, a new uniform, and you came up and uh, you had a brand new uniform, new shoes, all brand new outfit, and, uh, and uh, they carried away all the old stuff for you. And then you went downstairs to the dining room, and it was really, you could have lobster, and steak, you could have whatever you wanted. As I think, okay, you just walked in, you sat down, ordered it, and that was the thing. And he said, okay, everybody gets a partial payment for what the government owes you. They gave you maybe $20, $50, something like that. Now they said, you're in good hands now. The only way we're going to do anything to you is if you kill somebody. So they said, went out to Paris, and we went to the Polish Brazier, and we went here, and then we spent three days, it was so spectacular. And then the third day you came home, come back to the hotel, and they brought the trucks back, and they gave you the weapon back, and you went right back to the front. And that was it. And uh, that was my... you were going to say you put on your dirty clothes? No! It's like they said you really had a change of underwear. Yeah, you change with you, and you change with you, you know. <laughs> I want to thank Bob for giving the dissertation on the Medal of Honor, which Curtis Shoup won during the battle. Also, Rich Cady for all the research he's done on it, and the uh, program he put on up in Oswego, which several of us attended. But, in addition to the Medal of Honor, how many of you have ever heard of the Soldier's Medal? Now, the Soldier's Medal is not necessarily one in combat, but it is one for exceptional duty or call, which a soldier does. Now, you just heard Harry Saluma speak to you. Harry and I were an end company. I didn't know him during the war. He was a machine gunner, and I was in the mortars. Both Harry and I were born in Brooklyn, New York. But due to an early death in my family, I went back to Massachusetts where I was brought up by my aunts. I lost my Brooklyn accent. And as you can tell, I have the Harvard accent. <laughs> but Harry never lost his Brooklyn accent. So uh, his, his son was a physicist a scientist working in Natick, Massachusetts, near by Framingham, Framingham, where he now lives. And the son said to him, why don't you come up here, Dad? It's very nice. Get out of Brooklyn. So Harry and his wife moved up to Framingham. And that's where I met him. I was in the VF, in the American Legion in my home, and Harry was the commander of the Jewish war veterans. He was the commander of the America of the uh, VFW 929, and I joined his uh, unit. We did a lot of work together in schools, in the universities. We talked about the Holocaust. We put on exhibitions in libraries. We did a lot of work together. And I, of course, in his home many times. And I was in the den one day, seeing the citations and things, and I looked on the wall and I saw his medals. I said, Harry, what's that? I never saw that. He says, that's the soldier's medal. I said, oh, you got the soldier's medal. Well, he said, do you remember Bonnaroo? You fellows remember Bonnaroo, July. So he said, the company commander called me up, Big Jake Keltner. He was six foot three. He played football for the University of Georgia, and he played in the Orange Bowl. And he called Harry up. He said, Harry. So, Wilma, you were in the restaurant business with your dad. You know something about food. He said, I want you to make a big vat of coffee. Those fellows are out there in the foxholes. They're cold. They've got to stay there. It's miserable out there. Make some coffee or something. And uh, you know a lot of animals were killed during the war. 
and there's a dead cow out there. He says, see what you can do with that cow. Make some uh, sandwiches or something. So they got to work with this group, making the food and coffee. And about noontime, they heard this screeching and growling outside. You know, screeching and growling. It's a German tank outside the building. So Big Jake says, grab that bazooka and come with me. So they go out around there. By the time they got outside, the tank had gone down the road. I think they got one shot after it. And he says, Harry, you mean Big Jake put you in for the soldier's medal for going after that tank? He says, no, John, for making the hamburgers. I want to I want to tell you that today we had uh, I think a, a a nice reception of the DVD we showed and the medals that Curtis Shoup uh, earned and they're going to be presented to the National Infantry Museum on the uh, at the banquet on Sunday night. So we did show that DVD and the, the medals and a, a booklet this morning, and we're going to do the same thing on Saturday, I guess in this room, at 9.15 and 1.15. So if you haven't attended and want to, there's an opportunity. So in closing, thank you for being part of this, you, you volunteer draftees, and I uh, appreciate the, uh, the uh, uh, interest and the participation of uh, the people that are here and nobody walking out. We're kind of like a minister up here. You can make an hour of sermon and make it worth an hour and a half. So I guess that's what we did. So thank you folks.